Good Friday. How can one describe such a day? The wrongdoing of all humanity putting to an end an innocent man, the Son of God. This is the story of Jesus' death by way of a cross, all in one moment bringing death to the bright light of our future. He never stopped loving us, and yet this is the incredible part of it. Our sin stopped his heart. Our sin drove the nails firmly in the hands of God. All along, these were the plans. We told ourselves that we were in control, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. The brutal beating, the inhuman flogging, the naked humiliation. Heaven watched and saw it all. Our rebellion, our guilt, our shame, erasing the very notion of reconciling us with God, our sin and our debt, overcoming Jesus. Here is our King, obliterated. The enemy laughing, his plans unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of freedom rising. Now God's people are utterly broken. Behold the chains of mortality. Yes, this is what is true. We had heard the stories of old. The lost are found, the blind can see, the weak are made strong. But now we are witnesses to this reality. God is dead. We'd almost believed there is a way of redemption. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a peace beyond understanding. Now we know better. For us, we can say that God is encapsulated in this one realization. The single greatest sacrifice in human history is finished. How clearly we can see it. So what's so good about Good Friday? Just one thing, that the blood of Jesus can reverse the curse of sin and raise the dead to life. How clearly we can see it is finished. The single greatest sacrifice in human history encapsulated in this one realization. We can say that God is for us. Now we know better. There is a peace beyond understanding. There is a life of fulfillment. There is a way of redemption. We had almost believed God is dead, but now we are witnesses to this reality. The weak are made strong. The blind can see. The lost are found. We had heard the stories of old. Yes, this is what is true. The chains of mortality utterly broken. Behold, freedom rising. Now God's people are unstoppable. There's no longer the sound of the enemy laughing. His plans obliterated. Here is our King, Jesus, overcoming our sin and our debt, reconciling us with God, erasing the very notion of our rebellion, our guilt, our shame. Heaven watched and saw it all, the naked humiliation, the inhuman flogging, the brutal beating, and this was deemed sufficient for all of us. We told ourselves that we were in control. All along, these were the plans firmly in the hands of God. Our sin drove the nails, our sin stopped his heart, and yet this is the incredible part of it. He never stopped loving us bright light of our future all in one moment, bringing death to death by way of a cross. This is the story of Jesus, the Son of God, an innocent man putting to an end the wrongdoing of all humanity. How can one describe such a day? Good Friday.
Nails can be used for many things. A useful securing tool. A hammer is taken by the hand, it drives it in, that's the rule. A nail is needed when you build, it's a necessary thing. It was all also used over 2,000 years ago to hang upon the tree, the Messiah, the King. Trees are strong, they are made of wood. Their roots hold stronger in the storms like perhaps we wish we could. The roots of trees are strong and silent. They hung him there like many before. Although this time was different, even silent. The Messiah, the King. Crucify him, crucify him, the crowd shouted, which did nothing for those who were there who already doubted. And even when they mocked him, he never, ever shouted. Because he knew, like he said in the garden, not my will, but yours, Father. So the cross stands tall above us all as a reminder of the one who came to save us, the Messiah, the King, Jesus. Let's pray. He never said a mumbling word. Lord, we gather around the cross today in remembrance of the sacrifices that have been made for us. We may have a sense of unworthiness. We may have a sense of we've done this before. We may have a sense where God will not speak. But Lord, we would pray that your spirit would be at work today and that we would know that the, the silence, the quietness, of the cross means something to us. Lord, as we gather today, people from all over the place, those that are watching online, those that are here physically this morning, Lord, we would pray that the cross would mean something to us today, that we would have a new and fresh experience of the grace and the love that flows from the cross. And we pray this in your name. Amen. I'm going to ask you to remain standing as we sing together, I stand amazed in the presence.
seated, please. I'm going to read to you from the scriptures from Mark's Gospel and chapter 15, commencing to read at verse 16. The soldiers took him into their headquarters and called out the entire battalion. They dressed him in a purple robe and made a crown of long, sharp thorns and put it on his head. Then they saluted, yelling, Hail, King of the Jews! And they beat him on the head with a stick, spit on him and dropped to their knees in mock worship. When they were finally tired of mocking him, they took off the purple robe and put his own clothes on him again. Then they led him away to be crucified. A man named Simon, who was from Cyrene, was coming in from the country just then, and they forced him to carry Jesus' cross. Simon is the father of Alexander and Rufus. And they brought Jesus to a place called Golgotha, which means Skull Hill. They offered him wine drugged with myrrh, but he refused it. Then they nailed him to the cross. They gambled for his clothes, throwing dice to decide who would get them. It was nine o'clock in the morning when the crucifixion took place. A signboard was fastened to the cross above Jesus' head, announcing the charge against him. It read, the King of the Jews. Two criminals were crucified with him, their crosses on either side of his. And the people passing by shouted abuse, shaking their heads in mockery. Ha, look at you now, they yelled at him. You can destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, can you? Well, then save yourself and come down from the cross. The leading priests and teachers of religious law also mocked him. He saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. Let this Messiah, this King of Israel, come down from the cross so we can see it and believe even the two criminals who were being crucified with Jesus ridiculed him. May the Lord help us to absorb again the truths of the gospel story as we hear them today. I invite you to sing a song about that story that reflects on the beauty and the wonder and the starkness and the ugliness of the cross. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And yet, I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So let's sing together.
invite you to pray. God, our Heavenly Father, as we sing about the wondrous cross, the rugged cross, there's such a tension there because there's a deep love for this instrument of torture, not for the cross itself, but for what was accomplished on the cross. The great love that you had for us that gave Jesus to the cross to give his life that we might know life itself. Father, we pray today that as we worship, as we reflect, as we take into our hearts again the story, that our love might be deepened and widened, that our understanding of that act of love and grace might come afresh to us, that we might respond in an act of worship that says, we lay ourselves before you and honour you and ask that you might use us as part of your great plan for the redemption of the world, that we might be part of your plan of bringing men and women, boys and girls, a people of all nations to understand that God is for them. Hear our prayer this morning, for we pray in the precious name of Jesus. Amen and amen.
noon, darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. Then at three o'clock, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Some of the bystanders misunderstood and thought he was calling for the prophet Elijah. One of them ran and filled a sponge with sour wine, holding it up to him on a reed stick so he could drink. Wait, he said, let's see whether Elijah comes to take him down. Then Jesus uttered another loud cry and breathed his last. And the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. When the Roman officer who stood facing him saw how he had died, he exclaimed, This man truly was the Son of God. Some women were there watching from a distance, including Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the younger, and of Joseph and Salome.
Thank you to the worship team for leading us in worship. It's one of those things you're not really sure how much you should get into it on Good Friday. Um, it's, it's a good reminder for all of us that the name of Jesus, uh, we praise the name of Jesus and it, uh, it means something to us and it's significant for us. I want to read to you from Romans chapter 5, uh, picking up at verse 6 through to 10. It says this, Yeah. Okay. When we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. 
But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. While we were still sinners. For those of you who um, don't come to church very often, or perhaps it's the first time you've been here this year, my name's Matt, and um, I've joined the officer team. It's a long story, but I'm here, and, and it's really good. So uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to say g'day afterwards. The thing is with Good Friday is this. It's very difficult when we come to church on Good Friday to this sense of, there is a sense of remembrance, but there is also a sense of celebration. And we sort of, we kind of half bake ourselves because we're not sure to what extent we should be celebrating, what extent we should be reflecting and remembering because the, the whole story of Good Friday is about pain, is about anguish, is about sorrow, helplessness, hopelessness and uncertainty. So what exactly are we celebrating in the midst of all that? Now we know how the story ends. It's a better ending on Sunday than it is today. I'll just tell you that, all right? So it is a better ending on Sunday. But the, the truth remains for us that there is this idea that when we come and we gather for worship on Good Friday, that Christ died for us and we remember it. We punctuate our week or our year with this, this gathering today that Christ died for us. It's hard to imagine where the usness comes into this. I can remember, some of you will know my dad, and I can remember him warbling at the start of every Good Friday service, were you there when they crucified my Lord? Yeah? Yeah? And everyone says, no, we weren't there, actually. So how do we put ourselves in the story? We weren't there when it happened. We weren't, it wasn't, we weren't present at that time, the story we've read, the lead up to Jesus' death on the cross. We weren't there. And we haven't just insert ourselves into the story. We bring ourselves in and say, actually, I wasn't there, but it's good to be here. Because what it is, it's a word called cruciform. When it's, and it means for us that we are shaped by the, event, the events of Jesus' crucifixion. We are shaped by it. We are transformed by it. It is actually our story to live. The death of Jesus was for us. The scriptures tell us that the, the, the price of sin is death. And we don't want to pay that price. But we acknowledge today that Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world, paid that price for us. You know, it's not only the, the, the cross that shapes our lives. There are other things that happen to us that shape our lives. We can experience deep grief and that shapes our life. We get loss or uncertainty or failure or shame. And whilst it not, might not be on display, or sometimes, just let's be honest, sometimes it's on display more than you think it's on display, or I think it's on display, but sometimes we live, this shape of our life comes through the way that we act, the way that we behave, and the expectations that we have. So it raises this question for us. Why did Jesus die on the cross? The short answer is, because he had to. Because he had to. He was the only sacrifice that would have been acceptable, someone who was perfect, the Son of God, spotless, without blemish. If it was an ordinary person who had died for their sins, they would have died for their sins only, but not the whole world. That's where we get this word substitutionary atonement. It means a great deal, but let me just tell you this, someone did it for you. The price was paid for you. While we were all sinners, Christ died for us. Hebrews 9 reminds us, how much more then will the blood of Christ, through, who through the eternal spirit offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our conscience from acts that lead to death. You know, it's hard because there was actually nothing special about dying on the cross. 
I'm not going to suggest that we offer someone up this morning, but there was nothing, it was nothing unusual about it. Thousands and thousands of people right through ancient history were nailed to crosses. So the cross wasn't the big deal. The cross was only an example to other people of the control that people had over people. Slaves were hung, no good, whack them on a cross. Or people who had stature in society were, were nailed to a cross because of the humiliation that came with it. In fact, there are stories of people who were hung on a cross after they were dead, just for the humiliation, just to experience people mocking them and the humiliation that came with it. So when we say Jesus dying on the cross wasn't out of the ordinary, the actual act of it wasn't unusual. But we move past that and we say it's who it was that was the life-giving message for us. There wasn't only three people that ever died on a cross. Don't, don't go to Kurong and believe it, all right? It's not true, all right? There were more. And the person who hung on the cross was for us. We read in Philippians, who being the very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, the name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You see, we were made for relationship with God. We were made to be in this dependent relationship with a loving Father. We were also made to have relationships with each other. But we, the human race, and I include myself in that, ironically, however, we chose not to fulfil this purpose for which we were made. We chose a different direction. We thought, actually... I understand what you're saying, but I reckon I could do it a different way. I reckon I have a, a suitable alternative. And it's actually not, it's not how it's meant to be. And so what we do is we create our own purposes for life as opposed to a purpose of having a loving relationship with God through Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. Now, if you come on Good Friday, one of the words you will hear is sin. Everyone, everyone's got all this sin. We're going to, we, we've all got to deal with our sin. Fair enough. But we're all sinners. So we can, we can sort of get past that. But I want to suggest to you this morning that the actual, the, the, the meaning of the word sin is missing the mark. Missing the mark. Not like sinning like you've, you've you know, something big or large. And maybe, maybe it is. But sometimes we do miss the mark. Has anyone ever done archery? All right? Any, anyone any good at it? I did think about, I'll tell you, I'll confess this. I know it's Good Friday, but I'll confess it. I thought about bringing an, uh, one in and standing someone up the back, putting an apple on their head and shooting the, the nails and seeing how we go. But in archery, you, ha you have a target. Or if you, anyone follow the AFL football, go Tigers. You know, nobody likes the person who celebrates the goal that they didn't kick like someone running around high-fiving, I nearly kicked a goal. Or you, catch a, or you miss a bus. You miss it by 30 seconds or 30 minutes. You still miss the bus. Or turning up to work and your employer's standing there and, and you say, I was so close to getting to work on time, it wasn't funny. We missed the mark. And we do it in our relationships. We do it in our relationship with God and with each other. And we miss something. There's a Charlie Brown cartoon. Charlie Brown gets out the archery thing and he shoots it at a fence. And then he takes a tin of paint and a paintbrush and he paints around it. And if we do that, we'll always hit the bullseye. But that's not how we live. 
That's not what God wants for us. It's not what he desires for each of us. Galatians 5.17 says, For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. God gives us the opportunity to say today, I've missed the mark. And there's no price to pay for that. The price has been paid for us. You know, it's interesting, I think about the cross, and it's quite a moving experience for me today to see the cross come in in that fashion. But, you know, the thing is about the cross, it doesn't change God's mind about us at all. At all. What it does today is that it changes our mind about God. Because we, are, we remember when that cross comes in and those nails get driven in, that he took the sins of the world for us. I don't know if you've ever come to a dead end in your life or you've ever been driving somewhere and you've got lost or you've, you thought your life was going in one direction and all of a sudden it comes to a screeching halt and then you've got to find yourself in another direction because we, we do know what it's like to get to a hopeless end. We do know when we think that all hope is gone, where the future is perhaps grim or perhaps we get to an end of something that we, we started and we say it's time to do something else. But we do know what it's like to suffer at the end of hopelessness. We do know what it is like when we don't pursue or get the things that we want or the things that we believe that God had desired for us. And we pull back or we become disheartened. But we know and experience this hopeless end. And you know, the people that were with Jesus that time when they watched him now to that cross, those that had followed him, those that had seen his miracles, those that had believed all of his teachings... I can imagine them standing there thinking, it's done. We bought into it. Took some a bit longer than others. And this is how it ends. That's a hopeless end. But I don't want to steal anyone's thunder. You have to come back Sunday. I want to show you something on the wall. If there was a world championship of Rummy Cub, I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but I'd probably be it. All right? Who likes playing board games? Whose family has been ripped apart by a game that has been pulled out of the cupboard over the Easter weekend because parents were bored and children were bored and thought it was the best thing to do, but it's actually turned out to be the very worst thing to do? I'm asking for a friend, obviously, right? So board games, what about the next one? Oh, now, so just need to say, those things in the background, they're Christian prayer biscuits. <laughs> and what we've done is we've painted them to look like, yes. Why don't we move on? Yeah. Monopoly. I reckon the person who made this is taking the mickey out of all of us. Always starts out fun, I'll buy that hotel, I'll buy this, I'll steal this. Chess, Connect Four, you know. Nobody likes to play with the person who's got a fist full of um, draw fours. Yahtzee, that's a noisy game, I don't like that game. All these games serve one purpose. They have a beginning and they have an end. And in fact, if you play these games, regardless of your intention when you start out, it's going to be fun. And then it's not. And it gets packed up, it gets put in there. Everyone has a special cupboard in the house where the board games go or a drawer. And they get stuck in there until the next long weekend or the next holiday. And they come out again and you start again. You start again. Well, the makers of board games actually got quite bored with this because after you make the board game, there's nowhere else for it to go. So uh, I'm not really across all this information, but I'm gonna, it's never stopped me before, right? So then they started to build games like Xbox, Nintendo, and others. Do you know what they're called? No. 
And the whole point is, there is actually a point to this, the whole point was that the, they figured out that games began and the games ended. But they wanted to keep people in the game. So what they said was, Let's, these, these electronic games, they actually never end. They just keep going. So you get to the end of the level, and you don't pack it up and put it back in. You actually go to the next level. And then when you complete that level, you go to the next level. And then when you finish that, you go to the next level. And for me, when I think about the story of the cross, I could imagine standing there thinking, it literally all goes back in the box. It's all over. But in actual fact, Jesus says to us, it's not over. It doesn't go away. It's time to take your relationship, your love, your devotion, your uncertainty, my compassion to the next level. Because it's not a hopeless end. It doesn't end that way. It was never designed to end that way. You know, I think about times where we would imagine that we can't go on. Whether it's about faith, whether it's other areas of our lives. We say, it's just easier to just pack it up and put it away. I don't think God's calling us to that today. I think God is calling us to go to a new level. And that's not a commitment for those that are sinners and you know, need, to, need to confess all their sins. It's actually, it's actually for all of us. All of us. Even if we're squeaky clean, which no one is. Even if we're squeaky clean, God says there is more. How much more? Well, it's limitless. And it's available to all of us today. Ephesians 2. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions, even when we missed the mark today. It is by grace that we have been saved. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and not from yourselves. It is a gift of God. Not by works, not by getting all hot and sweaty so that no one can boast, but because of his great love for you. I mentioned before about the separation that we may have. Well, separation from God has been defeated. Jesus stood in that gap. Missing the mark has been defeated. Jesus has stood in that gap. And we have victory over sin because Jesus has defeated it for us. It's not game over. It's game on. All of us. All of us. I'm going to invite the team to come up and lead us in worship again. Just as I am. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And that thou didst bid come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as you are is the place where God comes and meets you and helps you because he has dealt with any separation that we may have because of the gift of the cross on Good Friday. Let's sing together.
today we come before you with all the things that we carry, all of our brokenness and woundedness, all of our guilt and all of our shame, all of our earthly baggage, all those things that weigh us down and cause us to stumble, all of those things that drain the life out of us, all of our hopelessness. Lord God, we, we bring it all to you today. But on this Good Friday, we thank you for this very good news, that for us there is a Redeemer, and his name is Jesus. And this gives us great hope. And so, Lord Jesus, we come and we acknowledge that you came and lived and loved and died so that we can truly live. And as we think about the sacrifice that you made to make all of that possible, we, we're so grateful. And we proclaim today that you are the Son of God. You are the Holy One the Messiah, that yours is the name above all names. We place all of our hope in you. Amen. We've just been singing about who we are, and now I want us to think about who he is, our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. I invite you to stand as we sing together. There is a Redeemer. Jesus, God's own Son, precious Lamb of God, Messiah. Let's sing.
And so we leave this place with assurance of forgiveness that is made possible through the sacrifice of Christ. Let's go forth in hope and anticipation of the ultimate victory that comes with Easter. Let's go forth with hope in our hearts. Amen. And we want to just say thank you for coming today and sharing with us. And we've heard today that the story doesn't end here. We've got the next episode coming. So we want to invite you to come and join with us again on Sunday at 10 a.m. as we celebrate the res resurrection of our Lord. God bless us all.